Well, very good morning to you. I hate to break up all the conversations, but would you stand with us as we worship God this morning? First John chapter 4, uh, verses 9 to 10, just two verses, and it should be on the, yes, it is behind me. It says this, in this the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world, that we might live through him. In this is love, 
Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be a propitiation for our sins. I know um, Sunday school is, is not on, so propitiation, big church word. All that, all that it means is a, a satisfying sacrifice. So Jesus Christ, the satisfying sacrifice for our sins. That is such good news. Uh, let's pray. Father, as we just continue to sing songs of, of worship and of adoration for all that you've done in Jesus, Father, we, we, we sit in the simple truth that you have loved us first. It's not that we have loved you, but that you loved us first and you reached out first and you, you sent your son first. And so, God, we, um, we just want to celebrate that and we want to be thankful of that, that you have loved us. God, we are unworthy of your love, but we thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you, if you want to continue in prayer, someone from the prayer team will be at the front, and we just invite you to, to yeah, think about what God has done for us this morning. Power of sin and dark.
sun to rise every morning colors the sky with the shades of his glory Well, good morning to you. Uh, if you are a guest here, my name is Lee. I'm one of the pastors uh, here at Crossridge. Glad that you've joined us this morning. Uh, great to gather like this. I know that for some of you, uh, you're in the middle of spring break time with your kids and school and all of that. Uh, but for all of us, today is actually Palm Sunday. It's a day we, uh, we remember Jesus' entrance into Jerusalem. Uh, this uh, time of year is a time that we, uh, we do set aside to focus on the events that happened around Jesus' uh, death and resurrection. And uh, next week, we have a great opportunity uh, on Good Friday. We'll be gathering here at 9 and 1045 to uh, just reflect on the events of Jesus' death on our behalf. 
And then on Easter Sunday or Resurrection Sunday, uh, we're going to be gathering again, 9 and 1045, with baptisms happening right in the middle of that, in between the two gatherings across the street. Uh, we have eight individuals, uh, at least, who are uh, getting baptized next Sunday. So I want to encourage you or just remind you now, uh, if you're coming to the first gathering, just plan to stay afterwards. If you're coming to the second gathering, plan to come a little bit early and uh, to witness those baptisms. It's always a great time and super fitting to do on Resurrection Sunday as we uh, look at individuals who are united with Christ in both his death and in his resurrection. So that is next week. This week, I'm going to ask Brody Lowen if he would uh, come up. Uh, Brody is bringing the word to us today. Brody is a senior high youth pastor at Willingdon Church in Burnaby, a place that I spent 13 years uh, on staff and another 12 years attending before that. It's the place I came to faith in Christ. When I left Willingdon, Brody was uh, a teenager. I uh, hadn't really had the chance. I knew he had gone off to Bible college and that sort of stuff, um, but hadn't really connected with him until this fall. He attended a preaching workshop that I was uh, helping to host here in, in the city, and I was like, oh, you've got a beard. You've grown up and all of that. Uh, he has impeccable taste in clothing, blue pants, and a brown shirt and brown shoes. So uh, we did not plan that, but... Uh, turned out pretty well. So let me just pray for you, Brody, as you, uh, as you preach for us this morning. Father, we thank you for your grace. We thank you today for your word, and uh, we want to be attentive to it. We want to uh, hear what the Spirit is saying to the church, and I pray for Brody as he uh, preaches to us today that uh, you just give him much grace and much joy and much confidence and trust in your word, and we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Lee. Good to be with all of you this morning. As Lee said, uh, I got to meet Lee when I was still just a teenager, and uh, it's fitting because he actually taught me one of my first Bible school, like college-level Bible classes. Um, so for a couple of reasons, it's his fault that I'm here today, um, but I'm just really thankful to be able to serve you and be with the church this morning in this way, so... Let's get into it. Uh, a couple summers ago, my family and I got to go to Disneyland. Has anyone ever been to Disneyland? Just talking regular Disneyland, not Disney World. Yeah, right. Um, so I'm not much for characters and autographs and all of that sort of stuff. But as we were walking through the park, uh, they had just opened up the Marvel like uh, Avengers wing of Disneyland. And we were going through and we saw Captain America. And now I'm a big Marvel fan, but my number one hero is Iron Man. Captain America, close second. Do I have any Captain America fans in the house? Okay, straight in the middle. So this story's for you, sir. Uh, <laughs> anyways, we lined up. I lined up. My family was like, whatever, go for it, I guess. I lined up, and uh, a couple of people went through, and I got to him. And when I met him, even though he was an actor... He was everything that I imagined Captain America would be. Charming and charismatic and encouraging. He even asked what I did. And I was like, I'm a youth pastor. And he said, that's a very important role in your community. Stay at it. And I'm like, who is this guy? You know, yes, sir, I will. But he was everything that I imagined Captain America would be. Have you ever had the opportunity to meet someone that you've been waiting to meet for a long time? And along with that question, were they what you expected? Because some celebrities or influencers, they can be the compassionate, kind, warm, tender-hearted people that we hope them to be. And sometimes, they don't quite measure up to our expectations. Today, as we've sang, as we've seen, as we've heard, is Palm Sunday which means that we are going to be in John chapter 12. So if you have your Bibles with you, you can open up to John chapter 12. This is looking at Jesus' triumphal entry that first Easter week. And there are a few groups of people in this passage with a few very distinct perspectives that I want us to consider this morning. We are going to see along the way that Jesus is nothing like what the people expected and we're going to see how Jesus is really more than we could ever imagine. 
John's account of this huge celebration is a surprisingly short two-sentence summary with some of his own commentary kind of spiced throughout. John is less interested in what's going on and more interested in what it all means. So, with Bible in hand, John 12, starting in verse 12, we're going to read it in little chunks. We're going to work through it together. So the first two verses here now. The next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. That's where we'll pause for now. So this is the week of Passover, and people from all over the land were coming to Jerusalem to worship and to celebrate together. The city was bursting at the seams. On top of that, locals and pilgrims were sharing rumors and stories of this prophet and miracle worker named Jesus. The place was buzzing. When the people heard that Jesus was coming, they were excited. They were frantic, even. They roared with praise and adoration. Their actions betray their expectations. And so we need to meet the Jesus the crowds wanted. The Jesus the crowds wanted. The crowds took palm branches to wave and to lay on the ground as Jesus rode into town. The palm branch was used for hundreds of years as a symbol of national pride for Israel. It was political. Palm branches were a statement of independence in times of political unrest. Use of a palm branch declared that the Jews would not be ruled by any external force or foreign power. We're coming up on an election year in Canada. Not this year, next year, unless something happens. And if it's not soon enough for us, America is in an election year right now. So if we turn our thoughts to the news cycle and we can think of all the rallies that have been in the past and that are and will be, we can imagine flags waving and banners flapping in the wind as this election year rolls around. In Canada, we might not have as much on display, but our neighbors to the south wear it with pride. They live and breathe their political party. With the division lines even deeper than ever before, the rally cry in support of one's party is loud and clear. Now, to be clear, I'm not suggesting that Jesus best fits any one of our modern political parties. But all I'm saying is that the Jews thought Jesus could be the one that would overthrow the government, sweep the government, and free them into the life that they thought they deserved. It was nationalistic fervor whipped into a frenzy. As they waved their branches, they shouted exclamations from Psalm 119, verse 25, which reads, Save us, we pray, O Lord. O Lord, we pray, give us success. When the crowd shouted, Hosanna, they were saying, Save us now. Save us now. That's what Hosanna means. It's a call to deliverance. The first 24 verses of Psalm 118, they declare God's goodness, his steadfast love, his ability to save in times of trouble. The psalmist says it's good to trust in God and not in man. Salvation is only from God. When Jesus rode into Jerusalem, the Jews were ruled by an external force, a foreign power. They cried out to God to save them from Roman occupation and restore their place as free citizens under God's rule, not pagan lordship. They shouted, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. And again, that's Psalm 118, now verse 26. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. This may sound like a common blessing, but the people were inciting more than that. See, through Israel's history, God anointed prophets and priests and kings to lead his people into knowing and serving and loving him. But God also promised a special deliverer, one that would come and deliver God's people even from their sins. This was their Messiah, which means anointed. The Jews expected the Messiah to deliver them from all oppression and free them forever. When Jesus showed up, the crowds knew that he wasn't just an average teacher. 
He didn't receive just a common blessing. No, the crowds declared that Jesus came in the name of the Lord. In effect, the crowds heard of Jesus' miracles, and they thought, this is him. This is who we've been waiting for. They've asked in earlier chapters of John things like, can this be the Christ? Can it be that the authorities really know that this is the Christ? And it says, too, when they heard these words, some of the people said, this really is the prophet. Others said, this is the Christ. We know that this was their emphasis because they finished their exclamation with, even the king of Israel. They elevated Jesus to be the promised one. John only mentions the kingship of John, uh, Jesus twice before this. The first was when Jesus called Nathanael to follow him at the very start of his gospel in John 1. John writes this, Nathanael said to him, that's Jesus, how do you know me? And Jesus answered him, before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. God opened Nathanael's eyes to see who Jesus really was. The second time, Jesus had just finished feeding the 5,000 on five barley loaves and two fish. The people had their fill. They saw that Jesus could do miraculous things, and they loved that he could provide for their needs. John 6, verse 15 says, He perceived then that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king. So Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. It should come as no surprise that John reveals that the crowds were mostly amazed as Jesus rode into Jerusalem because they heard of his miracle. They heard that he had raised Lazarus from the dead. So again, a provision. Look at verse 17. The crowd that had been with him, that he called, sorry, the crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. The reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they heard he had done this sign. The crowd that came with Jesus from Bethany and the crowds that came out to Jesus from Jerusalem, they were interested in this man who had power even to command death, to release its hold on a person. They might have noticed that Jesus' miracles and teachings lined up with what the Messiah would do. Maybe they were asking, could Jesus be the one who will deliver us from the shackles of political and social oppression? Could Jesus be our powerful, unstoppable king? The crowds wanted that Jesus. So the question we ask ourselves, is that the Jesus that we want? Life is stressful. We're burdened. We live in times of pressure and anxiety and pain. We might try to use religion or faith as the answer to those things. We expect that God will do something. We expect him to overcome every single challenge in our lives. Maybe we think that our allegiance to God means that God owes us something in return. Are we coming to Jesus just to solve the problems that we have in our lives. He does that, but it's not just that. We might have more in common with the Jews of today's story than we first realize. The people were celebrating Jesus' arrival in Jerusalem, and it's here that we meet our second group of people, the frustrated religious leaders. So again, in verse 19. So the Pharisees said to one another, you see, that he, you, you see that you are gaining nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. You see that you are gaining nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. The Pharisees, they saw Jesus as a troublemaker. They saw Jesus as an insurrectionist. And worst, they saw him as a blasphemer. How could anyone want to follow him? Throughout the Gospel of John, Jesus and the Pharisees clash because of Jesus' claim to be God, being one with the Father, coming from heaven and going back to heaven, forgiving sins and doing things only God could do. Jesus was on the Pharisees' hit list. The Jesus the Pharisees wanted 
was a dead and gone Jesus. They couldn't stand his reputation or the works he was performing or the way that he was saying things. To make matters worse, they now had to deal with Lazarus. John wrote in verses 9 to 11, just before our reading today, that it was on account of Lazarus being raised that many were turning to Jesus. The Pharisees had to get rid of Jesus and Lazarus to get a grip on the situation. They devoted themselves to destroying Jesus and anything or anyone that he touched. They denied all that he said. They explained away his miracles as works of the devil, power from the enemy. They didn't want Jesus. We may know people who want nothing to do with Jesus. They might be antagonistic toward him or towards Christians. I saw a shirt once that said, when Jesus comes back, we'll kill him again. And that's irreverent, yes. But that's sort of the mentality of some people. It was certainly the mentality of the Pharisees. We have to kill him. Maybe it's you. Maybe you wouldn't go that far to wear a shirt like that, but maybe it's you that wants nothing to do with Jesus. Or at least, you might just not want to hear much more about him. He isn't significant to you. Or maybe we're sitting in this room and we're uncomfortable with what Jesus asks of us when he calls us to follow him. I think our actions betray us more than we think. When we give in to sin and temptation, when we choose our own pleasure and desires over God's desires, we effectively say that we love that thing more than we love God. We might be more like the Pharisees in our hearts than we want to admit as we seek our own control and power and choice instead of submitting to the king. The Pharisees, they realized that the whole world was being swayed by Jesus. This was perhaps hyperbole, but in the next few verses, we see how true this statement was. So let's carry on. Verse 20. Now among those who went up to worship at the feast were some Greeks. So these came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and asked him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Now, I know we're focusing on Palm Sunday. We don't know if this passage took place right on Palm Sunday, but it was certainly close in time. When these Greeks heard that Jesus was doing these things, was saying these things, was here, they wanted to meet him. They wanted to understand him. And so we need to consider the Jesus the Greeks wanted. Greeks were known as pursuers of truth. They wandered the earth looking for new philosophies, for new truths. John started his gospel talking about logos. Logos means word in Greek. It's a word the Greeks would have understood from centuries of famous philosophers. Their greatest thinkers attempted to make sense of the world, to put it in order. Some like Plato concluded that this logos was the power that kept the world running. So John was strategic in his choice of word. Did these Greeks connect Jesus' powerful words of healing and teaching and wonder if he was the one who had this great power? We don't get a completely clear picture. All we know is that they went to Philip, who had a Greek name and was from a town near the border of Israel. He was probably the most like them. And then Andrew was also a Greek name, and so the two of them, they've worked together in John's gospel before, and they go to Jesus to let him know that these men have arrived. And what was it that the Greeks asked? They said, sir, we wish to see Jesus. We wish to see Jesus. We don't know the depth of their intention, but the heart of these Greeks, I think, should be our heart as well. We wish to see Jesus. Who is this Jesus? We wish to see him, to know him, to understand. Are we ready to receive what he has for us? Are we ready to receive him as he is? Do we wish to see Jesus? 
Jesus knew that the coming of the Greeks was more significant than anyone else realized. He knew that what was about to happen to him would eventually be seen and heard all over the world, just like the Pharisees feared. So we see verse 23, Jesus' response. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Until now, Jesus has been saying, my time has not yet come. As he ministered, he would remove himself from circumstances where people wanted to force their agenda on him. This happened back in John 6, which I mentioned earlier. When the Jews first tried to make him king, Jesus withdrew from them. And he does it over and over again through the gospel. See, Jesus always walked in step with his Father in heaven. His ways were God's ways. He operated on God's schedule, not his own. He did what the Father sent him to do, which was often painful and costly. Now, Jesus identifies the end is here. He was living in the final moments of his mission. This week would change the world. The Greeks coming to him were his sign. But he wasn't going to change the world with strength and power and might, at least not in the way that we expect. Instead, he came with meekness and humility. And so if you've been following along in your Bibles, you'll know that I skipped a couple verses right in the middle, kind of the core of this passage. So let's go back to those verses and see how Jesus acted through this passage. Let's see how Jesus acted in response to all these perspectives. As the crowd surged and sang and shouted... As the Pharisees sneered, here's Jesus' response to the Jews coming to him. Verse 14. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written. Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. This is not the image of a powerful, conquering king. A king should ride in on a war horse, a powerful and terrible beast. He should be high above the heads of all of his subjects, riding with majesty and strength. Riding a donkey, and that hardly puts you higher than the people that you're riding through. A donkey was a work animal. It was a beast of burden. What was Jesus doing? And the reality is, he was revealing his true identity. Here's the Jesus the world really needs. John paraphrases Zechariah chapter 9, and the prophecy in Zechariah says this, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he, humbled, or sorry, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal, of a donkey. Is that not what the people were doing? They're rejoicing. They're rejoicing. But do they know who they are rejoicing? John is quick to show that even Jesus' disciples didn't quite get it. Verse 16. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. The disciples constantly wondered what Jesus was doing and what he was saying. They misunderstood his intentions and his instructions. They stumbled a lot. And along the way, Jesus kept lifting them up, correcting them, and showing his love and grace toward them. Even after he rose from the dead, they had more to learn. Have you ever had one of those eureka moments where suddenly something clicks and something makes sense to you? It could be as basic as finally remembering where you left those car keys. That was me this morning. Or it could be that you're listening to a lecture or a sermon in class. You're turning an idea over and over and over again, and then suddenly it hits the aha moment, as philosophy calls it. That eureka, you get it. It comes to life. The disciples don't have Bibles that they could flip back to Zechariah and say, ah, here, we expected this. Okay, good, got it. They certainly had the Old Testament, that's true. 
But as they're going through the crowds, this was maybe not what was on their minds. But you can perhaps imagine the disciples sitting after Jesus had risen from the dead, sitting in the temple, maybe overhearing a rabbi teaching from Zechariah. And suddenly a smirk comes across John's face as he heard the prophet being read, or a light dawns on James's face, or there's a gasp from Simeon. They got it. God opened their eyes. They understood. As mentioned, I lead senior high youth at Willingdon, and I love the students I get to work with. But too many times, an alumni will come back to me later on, years later, and say, you know, I never really understood this thing about God, and then they'll fill in the blank of whatever it is they just came to understand. Or, no one ever told me that Jesus, dot, dot, dot. And I stand there, and I smile, as they tell me something that I have told them week after week after week after week. But I'm glad that finally, the Holy Spirit has opened their eyes to understand this great truth that has been in front of them for so long. When we come to Jesus with our misplaced expectations or our incomplete understanding, he is not disappointed. We're given opportunities to grow. So ask your questions. Confess your doubts. Jesus will lift you up. He will correct you. He will show you love and grace. We need to keep in connection with the church. We might not understand what God is doing in the moment of what he's doing. But that doesn't mean we won't get to look back one day and see how God brought everything together through it all in the end. And we get to do that together with one another. The disciples, they didn't understand what Jesus was doing or why he said what he said or what his actions truly revealed about him. Both they and the rest of the Jews had the wrong idea about Jesus. Jesus came riding in on a donkey to signify that he came to bring peace. He came in humility. He is truly the king of Israel, but not the king that the people expected or hoped for. They were hoping in the wrong Jesus. I've hoped in the wrong Jesus before. And when we do that, we might get upset that things don't go our way. We might get angry when it seems like God isn't answering our prayers, at least not in the way that we want. We try to live life on our own terms. We can try to manipulate Jesus to be a God of convenience or affirmation or accommodation. We can make Jesus into almost anyone we want him to be. The only problem is that wouldn't really be him. We need to check our expectations, dare I say our idolatry, about Jesus and ensure that we are following him for who he really is, the humble king who came to give up his life not to take up the sword. Jesus rode in on a donkey to demonstrate his purpose. He was focused on the coming glory. So let's think back to Lazarus again. The Jews, they were excited about Jesus because he had risen, he had raised Lazarus from the dead. John 11 verse 4, just before this passage, says, uh, Jesus says, this illness that Lazarus has does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God, so the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now, we read ahead in the story, Lazarus does die, but Jesus raised him so that God would be praised. Jesus was now closing in on the cross, and he knew that he would be glorified through his own death and his resurrection. Jesus knew that his death was not going to end in death. His death was going to lead to life for so many people others. The question is, how? And that's where Jesus takes us to the end of our reading today, at least, in verse 24 through 26. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. 
Whoever loves his life loses it, and whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me, and where I am, there will be my servant also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Jesus is the grain of wheat that falls to the earth and dies. When a farmer plants wheat, it's buried in the earth, and there it sprouts, and it can produce hundreds of times over. In the same way, Jesus will be buried in the earth after his death on the cross. And in a few days, he will burst from the tomb, full of life and able to give life to any and all who would come to him. When we submit to him, when we follow Jesus, he gives us eternal life. We receive the honor of the Father. We bear the name of Jesus as Christians. And we are recognized by God, our Father, as his children, truly. It is an honor to belong to God. There will be a day when Jesus returns, when God's children get to live in his perfect and good and holy presence forever. But we only belong to God and receive life in Jesus when we give up our lives for, or to Jesus. When we compare the love we have for him to the love of the things of this life, there's no comparison. It's night and day. We live for Jesus. All else comes after him. When we live like this, people will necessarily have to ask, what's different about you? What's going on here? Why are you like this? And we get to show them Jesus. We get to show them God. We get to bring them into God's presence. We get to bring God glory and make him known through every aspect of our life. We live differently. So the question we have to ask is, will we submit? That's a hard word. Will we submit to his ways? Will we let Jesus direct our paths? Even when the path goes places we don't want to go. Jesus is capable of carrying our dreams and our plans and our education and careers and families. He is capable of healing us in sickness and death. He is capable to free us from oppression. He is capable to save us from our sin, but it might not look the way that we expect. Jesus gives us life by giving up his own. When we trust in Jesus, we glorify both the Son and the Father because it is God's power and prerogative to save us. It's his choice. It's up to him. We can't do it ourselves. The Jews and the Pharisees and the Greeks and the disciples, they wanted their type of Jesus. So who is the Jesus that we want? And is he the Jesus that we need? We can cling so tightly to our own lives as though our lives depended on us. We can cling on to a version of Jesus that doesn't require us to suffer or to get uncomfortable. So often we don't want the real Jesus. But Jesus really wants us. We need a king that's willing to give up his own life for us. We need a king who can save us from our sin. We need a king who is alive eternally and extends eternal life to us. That's what Jesus offers, to take us from sin and death and deliver us into life with God our Father forever. He might not be the king that we expect or the king that we hope for, but he is so much more a king than we could ever imagine. So don't lose your life. Don't reject Jesus. Run toward him. Meet him, maybe for the first time today. Even when the crowds didn't fully understand. Even when the disciples didn't fully understand. Even when the Greeks were just curious and the Pharisees wanted to kill him, Jesus came for them. Jesus comes for all of us. So this Easter week, let's follow the good king. Let's see what Jesus has in store. Let's pray together.
Father God, I am so thankful that in your sovereign love for us, you looked on our situation with love. And you sent your son to die and to be raised from the dead so that we may have life as well. Holy Spirit, thank you for giving us, well, for being present with us, for convicting us, for giving us uh, your presence, for being all around us all the time. Jesus, your love knows no end, your love knows no bounds, and nothing is stronger than you. And so we come before you reminded this day that you came to give your life. You came so that you could raise many to life with you. And so I pray, Lord, that we would be reminded this day, this week, as we prepare with Good Friday and Easter morning around the corner, that we would rejoice, even as we sang this morning, in your goodness to us, in your love for us, that you did not uh, despise the cross, but instead you scorned its shame, and you rose from the dead so that we may have life with you forever. May the hope of eternity be on our minds, our hearts, and our lips as we go from this place this day. May we draw others into this same life that we have. And Father, if there's anyone in this room today who is hearing this word, perhaps for the first time, or at least that your spirit is opening their ears and their eyes for the first time, I pray that they would become brother and sister to us here. They would become son or daughter to you, Father God. There is nothing that is holding them back. You invite us all with open arms. We thank you, Jesus, for this promise, and we pray this in your most powerful name. Amen. Amen. Pastor Lee. Amen. Thank you for that word, Brody. Uh, we, each week, we take time as a church to celebrate the Lord's Supper together, to enter into and to be reminded of what it is that Jesus has done for us. Uh, one of the things we, the songs we were singing today uh, had this line, when I was a sinner, he saved me from who I was. Now, it is true that Jesus actually saves us from far more than that. He saves us from the wrath of God. Uh, but I was thinking of these words from Titus chapter 3 where it says this, For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. And then it says, But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, He saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy by the washing of regeneration and renewal by the Holy Spirit. Uh, that's the good news of the gospel, is when the kindness of God our Savior appeared. And when that kindness appeared is when Jesus appeared. He saved us, and he saved us not because of our works. He saved us because of his grace. Uh, and that's the thing we ought to remember every time we take the Lord's Supper is that uh, this is not a work that we do. We're not saved on the basis of works that we have done in the past. We are saved on the basis of what Jesus has done for us in his death for us on the cross. Uh, and so that's the reminder today as we come uh, to celebrate the Lord's Supper. It's the reminder that in his mercy, God sent Jesus to be our Savior. Um, so the way we do this, uh, if you're a guest with us, is we come forward, we take the bread that represents the body of Jesus that was given as a sacrifice on the cross. We take the cup that represents his blood that was poured out or that was shed for our forgiveness that washed us clean. And uh, we'll take those back to our seat and then we'll all partake of communion together. So you can do that while the band comes. And if you would like to pray with someone this morning, uh, you can do that down, uh, down here at the front as well. Would you stand with us this morning?
Here's what we read uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, where Paul says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's do that together. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's do that together. And then that passage ends by saying, or that the next verse says, for as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so that helps us remember that uh, as we celebrate the Lord's Supper, we're not just looking back, we're also we're looking ahead, we're looking forward to the day uh, that we will be in the presence of Jesus. Uh, something good to bear in mind. So we're going to sing one more song in worship, and then uh, just a couple announcements for you at the end.
spend the last hour or so together. Just a couple quick announcements on your way out the door. Uh, I already mentioned this week, Good Friday, 9 and 1045, uh, Easter Sunday, 9 and 1045 with baptisms in the middle of that. Also want to let you know that uh, if you are new to our church, you're wanting to discover more about it, we have a mission and members class. It is happening on April the 14th. That is a Sunday evening. Uh, so you can sign up for that. Just go to our website and you'll find the details there. We'd love to have you there. Great chance to ask questions. Great great chance to find out, you know, structure and, and all of those sorts of things. So that's uh, coming up. As you go today, let me just read this uh, benediction for you. Now may the, the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times in every way. The Lord be with you all. Have a great week.